So um, Cole and I work together in the same division and um, basically any of your federal grants except for special ed funding is us, okay? So we're going to give you some highlights today, some updates, but also, you know, the size of the group will allow us to get off task a little bit if you have some questions. So we definitely can do that too. I'll try and repeat those questions if you'll remind me so that anyone that's listening at home um, can definitely, or at work, I guess they're probably not at home, um, can definitely hear the questions that you have as well. Uh, we also have a couple of other staff members in our office that are maybe point people that you would be familiar or will be familiar with. Um, Valerie, um, did any of you attend the EL session earlier today? Yeah, okay. So she's our assistant director of English Learners and Migrants. And then Dwayne Marshall is our assistant director for Title Grants, uh, focusing on Title I, II, and SIG. Um, so really, this is, we also have specialists that are assigned to your school. Um, so our, just a little bit about our structure. Um, we have an individual who is assigned to your school that will support your school with Title I, Title II, and school improvement grants, and then a separate specialist for English learners, um, 21st century um, Title IV. Okay, but Title I, II, and SIG are very similar in scope, and so uh, trying to reduce the number of people that you all um, have to work with. Um, we do have resources for you. All of those grants have their own communities on Learning Connection. Um, we also have created a new landing page for our division so that all of those grants and hyperlinks are in one place. Um, it's a very difficult website to remember, slash grants, okay? Are we good? Yeah? <laughs> so doe.in.gov slash grants. Um, so if you need to get to any of your funding uh, and need to know some additional information, you can go there. And then we also have the department keeps an updated list of uh, program administrators. So every year when you apply, we ask you who's the program administrator. Um, and so we update that list and periodically we'll send out emails regarding a grant or a system. Have any of you gotten an email from our office? Okay, so that's because you're labeled as the program administrator. So if that ever changes, then make sure you let us know and you can let your current specialist or go to that website and our contact information is there and we'll get that fixed for you. Uh, so our agenda for today, we have some updates for the title programs. Um, uh, the status, uh, opportunities for school improvement grants, Title IV and 21st century. We have some new information about um, significant expansion of charters and new charters, as well as some general essay information that is in place because of our title funding. Okay? Um, is there anything up there that you said, oh, they left out this and I really wish they were going to talk about this? Or you may say, I, I don't want to know about these things, leave those off. Is there anything you would like me to add? No? Okay. All right. So Title I, um, the um, you know, general premise of the program is to support our at-risk kids of meeting the state's challenging academic standards. Uh, many of us know that Title I is, is tied to poverty, that that's how we generate the allocations. But remember, the services are based upon your children who are at risk. Um, we can have children who are in poverty who excel, who don't need Title I services, and children who are affluent that are struggling. And so remember, once the funding gets to you, then you're util utilizing the funding for children who need academic support. Um, so how many of you uh, are with a charter or a charter network who was existing prior to this year? Is that all of you? Okay, do we have any brand new first year charters? One, sort of. Maybe. <laughs> you have some of both. Okay. So we may have some at home that, um, or at work, they're working. Uh, sorry, I keep saying at home, um, that are brand new charters. But I'll keep that in mind when we talk about our guidance. So anyways, the applications per federal rule, we have to have the deadline starting July 1. Um, there's a constricted time period for utilizing federal funding for Title I. So those were due July 1. Um, however, many LEAs, charters, needed time after that, and that's definitely okay. Um, where we are, department staff have looked at every single Title I grant that has been submitted. Um, and either many of them have been approved or returned for feedback. 
Um, so if you think that you're still waiting on the department for feedback and you want to get Title I started, um, that shouldn't be the case. You should have already been contacted by your specialist and said, here are things that need to be addressed or I've moved it on for approval. Okay, so that's just an FYI. If you're waiting on us, that shouldn't be the case and let me know and we'll get that figured out. Um, if you have feedback and you've submitted that back to us, many of us are in the second review process and moving towards final approval. Um, have any of you have your Title I grant fully approved and you're good to go? Some of you, okay. Everyone else that hasn't had it approved, have you gotten feedback? Yeah, okay. If you're not sure, let me know. Find me after, okay. Um, one of the things I want to call out the big change of ESSA in terms of implementing federal funding for Title I. One of them was um, we got more money as a state with Title I, however, this, the um, federal regs said you have to pull back more money before you allocate it to the schools uh, through our school improvement funding. So later I'm going to talk about our school improvement grants. Those were offered to more at a higher amount because we had to take more off the top from Title I Basic. So even though we got more funding, we weren't al uh, allowed to allocate as much as what we had in the past. So that had a direct impact on some of our individual LEA allocations. That's one. The other big one is that supplement not supplant for Title I has changed. Um, the rules in the past for other federal grants have stayed exactly the same. Um, so all of us know that we need to pay for our fourth grade math teachers, our principals, those kinds of things with our state tuition dollars. Um, and that your title funding truly needs to add to it. Um, it's a little bit relaxed now with Title I um, where um, some of the presumptions of supplanting have gone away. So when you're trying to think about implementing your Title I grants, I want you to think about these questions instead of maybe some old ones that you thought about prior to deciding how to use the money. So first, is it allocable? Can I say that it directly allocates to the Title I program? Is it benefiting my Title I students and program? Is it consistent with my Title I plan that you have as your school-wide plan? And then last one, is it benefiting your high-needs students? Okay. So if you start out with the premise of how can I support my students at the highest level, if you ask that question first, there's a likelihood that we're going to get you to approving what you would like to do with your title funding. Okay. You can ask questions as you go, so if you have any, make sure you interrupt me. Okay. All right, Title II, um, ESSA changed the title of this grant to Supporting Effective Instruction. So instead of improving teacher quality, they're focusing on effectiveness now, um, rather than just stating that s teachers need to be highly qualified and then never addressing whether they are effective or not. So there's a shift with, with several of the pieces of implementing federal grants. Um, those applications were due by September 1st. If you missed it and said, uh-oh, I haven't applied, that's okay. I can work with you on trying to get that in. Um, we notified everyone who had money but had not yet applied and asked them kindly, please turn in your application. Um, but just know that I can work with you on that time. Um, for Title II, um, the total federal funding for this grant went down. Um, across the board, across the nation. So the amount that Congress allocated went down, um, I think 17%. Um, so that had a direct impact on all of our LEA allocations. Um, we also have gotten the question, well, I, I have an impact that's different than just 17. Uh, no Child Left Behind numbers were refreshed for ESSA. Um, so your census poverty data that feeds into Title II was addressed. So if you've had a big shift in um, demographics or counts from 2001, that also impacted because it's refreshed now for 2017. And then um, lastly, there's no hold harmless in Title II. Many of you are probably familiar with that in Title I. You say, I know I can bank on 85, 90, 95%. Are any of you familiar with the hold harmless figures for Title I? For Title II, there was a hold harmless behind the scenes. You just didn't know it. Um, and the feds required us to put that into place. Um, <coughs> under ESSA, that hold harmless <coughs> is removed completely. So for Title II, your allocation is going to be consistent with your true counts of children in poverty in total counts every single year. 
So if your allocation goes way down, or sorry, your counts go way down, so will your allocation. There won't be any kind of buffer supporting that. Um, we are having a goal um, to make sure that we're providing, um, that says 2018, we don't want a year. Well, we'll do it before then. We're going, by the end of this month, 2017, we're going to uh, have as a goal to either approve your Title IIA grant or get feedback back to you, okay? As long as it was turned in by September 1. Um, and then if you're a new charter in the room, this applies for Title I, too. We legally are required to give allocations to new charters by January 1. Um, however, after your October 1st PE count, your pupil enrollment count, that's the data we need to generate federal funding. So um, we're going to work hard as soon as we get that count from October to generate your funding so that we can get it to you sooner than January 1. So if you're a brand new charter and you say, I haven't gotten any money yet, well, that's because we're, we need that data certified from your October count. Okay? A big surprise with Title II for charter schools this year was that we couldn't use our charter as our comprehensive need mm -hmm. assessment and so that was a lot of additional work mm -hmm. to get that together and that came about because of um, the shifts in ESSA so ESSA requires that you have a, a CNA a comprehensive needs assessment and that it has certain factors within it um, and many of those don't necessarily exist within charter agreements um, some of them may and you can, and if they are in your existing charter, then pull it from your existing charter and place it in that CNA. Um, but ESSA says that you have to have a Title IIA plan that focuses on EL students with disabilities and um, high ability students specifically. You have to show how your Title IIA plan aligns with state standards and how you're coordinating it with other funding streams. And that level of detail specifically called out within a charter is highly unlikely. Um, it, because it wants to show a direct correlation between Title II and those activities itself. Um, so it's similar to the fact that a traditional public school has a school improvement plan that guides, or it should guide, everything that they do. And I would say that probably is pretty consistent with your charter. This is our plan. This guides everything that we do. And if you have that level of detail in your charter, pull it out and stick it in the CNA. But likely it may not be there, um, and so we have to be that explicit. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. It does. Okay. Yeah, I think prior to having a CNA under No Child Left Behind, many um, Title IIA grants, you can see a stark difference between now, this year, when we have a CNA, that I would say, not that prior people were not thoughtful, but I see much more improved professional development plans that are utilizing Title IIA this year because we've said, okay, it has to be tied back to your needs. And how is Title IIA going to support that? Whereas prior, it was a smorgasbord of activities um, that weren't coordinated in any way. So that isn't the rule, but across the board, that was a pretty common theme. Title III, um, uh, for, for this, um, uh, prior to talking about Title III, we'll look at the fact that um, any public school, including our traditional pubs and our charters, um, are legally bound to providing services to English learners on top of the core education program. Typically, that's going to be delivered by a certified EL teacher. Um, and so in order to make sure that that's in place, um, a couple years ago we started doing this to comply with that federal rule that the department was monitoring it. So um, English learner plans, uh, those were due by September 1st. Many of you have given that to us in the past through Title III, but some of our charters don't accept Title III, but you still have English learners, or you still might get one tomorrow, so we still have to have that plan in place. Um, and so uh, any kind of charter is going to be submitting that information to us. Um, so here's some updates for NESP and Title III. How many of you accept either of these funding streams? Some of you do. Okay. So NESP is our state money. Um, and that one, because it's state money, is much easier to apply for. It doesn't have all those federal strings that you're used to with other federal grants um, because it is state money. You can apply on your own even if you have one child. The application is much easier than title because it's not a federal grant. So if you um, 
really we would like any charter who has any English learners at all, even one, to apply for it. It's 250 bucks per kid. Um, so if you have one, 250 bucks of extra materials or some after school tutoring or some PD for the teacher who has that English learner can go a long way. Um, but it, it, um, is there available for you? Title III um, is our federal grant. You do have to have 10,000 to apply on your own. Um, but if you don't have 10,000, you can join up with others to create a consortium. Um, so many of our charters are joining up with charters that are um, in their same network and collectively among all of them, when they add their allocations together, they get to 10,000 and then give us one application and that's a federal rule. Um, if you don't have that opportunity, we have some statewide consortia through our educational service centers um, that you could join up with one of them and tap into some PD and resources through them. So um, just keep that on your radar. Every year we release all of these funding streams, Title I, Title III, Title II, NESP, all are coming out around July 1st, hopefully prior to that. So just know that these are things that you're eligible for. Title III, um, we get about eight and a half million, um, and that's been pretty static the past several years. Oh, sorry, do you have to have $10,000 or 10,000 students to get Title III? $10,000. Um, and so uh, to apply individually, you have access to the funding um, if you apply collectively through a consortium for Title III. Um, so about eight and a half million for Title III in the past several years, but our numbers of English learners have continued to change, even though the total pot of money has not changed. Um, so that equates, I think it's about 150 bucks per kid, I think, um, for Title III. Might be different than that. Off the top of my head, it's roughly that. Um, so uh, the you know, number of children to get there, 60 to 70 is common um, to get you to 10 grand. Um, but yeah, NESP, our state funding is $250 per child, and then there's an additional increase if your charter school has 5% of English learners or 18% of English learners of your total population. So another thing I want to make, now we're going to get into some opportunities. That was some prior updates. Here are some opportunities for you of additional funding. Now uh, these um, criteria vary, okay? So, so school improvement grants, these were released recently. Um, uh, so there are two different ones. They have very distinct and different names. One of them is 1003G, one is 1003, okay? Can you keep those two separate? Yes, I get them confused quite often. Know that they are two different ones um, and they're for different purposes and different types. So keep, keep that in mind. So the first one, 1003G is a competitive grant um, and we are using funding from No Child Left Behind um, and it is going to be for a total of four years and the grant is for 50 grand per year up to $500,000 per year. Well, who is eligible? You have to be a Title I served school, okay? Many of our charters are, okay? Do we have any non-Title I charters in the room? A couple, okay? All right, but you do have to be Title I served, and then you also have to be a focus or priority school, okay? So if you um, were previously designated as focus or priority, including our first time DNF schools from 2016 grades, Okay, so all of those schools have been populated into an eligible list and it is posted on our website for you to see a column that says, are you Title I served last year? Yes or no. Are you a focus or priority, including first time DNFs? Yes or no. If both of those are yeses, then you qualify to apply for this grant as well as the next one I'm talking about. All right, so 1003G is going to be very limited in scope. It's competitive um, and we're talking about allocating two to five grants. So two to five schools are going to be successful in getting the 50 grand to 500 grand per year for four years. So that's highly competitive. Um, know that you have until October 27th to apply for that. So if you think you're interested in that, um, do look on our website slash grants to pull down the application and there's a video that explains it further. Yes? Per school per network? Per school. All right, the other one that's quite a bit easier to apply for because if you're Title I, 
and you are focus or priority, including our first time DNFs, and you submit an application, congratulations, you're approved, okay? So the next one, 1003, is going to be formula. So if those same criteria apply to you, um, we have a grant on the website, and it's been posted for several weeks now, um, and that is going to be due by the end of September. Okay? So um, all of you have worked on a school improvement plan. Okay? So if you are a current focus or priority school, this year, per federal rule, we had to implement more rigorous school improvement plans for our DNF schools that had to focus on instruction, student support, and leadership. Okay? So those three areas are the same focus areas of 1003. So if you said, we're going to do these things better in these three areas to help our school performance improve, now there's a little bit of funding that can support you to carry out those activities, okay? So those need to align. Um, so 1003 um, is going to be 40 grand and it's for, for one year. So if you apply, follow the instructions, the department will work with you to help you get a compliant plan in place and then you'll have the funding for this year, okay? And know that we have further videos that walk you through this. Pull up the applications themselves. Um, if you go to the grants website, but this is our direct website to school improvement um, slash SIG. Okay? So that's one opportunity. Two other opportunities. Uh, have any of you heard of Title IV yet? A few? Yes? Okay. So Title IV um, was a new funding stream when ESSA was implemented. Um, as a state, we get about $6 million. Um, so if we allocated that out in a formula basis across all schools, you might get $37. I don't know, maybe $40, i am not sure. Um, so we are doing it in a competitive nature. However, um, we have written into the application that if you get it this year, you're not going to be eligible next year or the year after. So our intent is for one year to get some funding to improve some systems that Title IV focuses on, and then knowing that if you weren't successful this year, apply again next year, and the people who got it this year are now removed from the eligible pool. So we would like everyone who is interested in the funding that they would have an opportunity at least once every three years, as long as Congress still continues to fund this to have an opportunity for Title IV. Well, what is Title IV? Um, Title IV has three focus areas. One of them is um, improving your well-rounded education, so uh, improving the curriculum that you have in the course offerings, so dual credit, AP, IB, um, looking at your systems to improve course offerings and, and what you do to provide a well-rounded education to students. So that's one bucket area. The second one is safe and healthy or social and an emotional supports. So Title IV says, okay, let's improve our systems for positive behavior supports, counseling, um, drug-free schools, bullying prevention. You know, we need some funding to provide us some time and supports to improve those conditions for kids. So it could be used on those areas. Um, and then the last one is technology integration. Um, so if you apply for it in that way, know that only 25% of whatever you were successful in getting can be used on things like hard devices or software uh, infrastructure pieces. Most of it is focused on how to utilize the technology. Okay, So um, we see lots of great technology in schools, but there's a clear need that goes with that technology of how do I use it. Okay, um, I think we saw a smart board one time being used as a bulletin board, you know, of sorts. So the PD needs to go along with technology for it to be effective. And so that's the third focus area of Title IV. Okay? So as a school, you could focus on all of those areas, or you may say, we have lots of needs, but we have other funding streams to address some of them. We're only going to focus on social and emotional. And here's what our school needs, and here's our plan. Can we have some money? Okay? So um, Title IV, the deadline for that, about a month away, October 16. Um, Cole has starred in a video that's on our website um, that explains and walks you through the application and what you need to submit to us. Okay, so we're expecting probably 100 LEAs um, are going to be approved for some funding for this.
Okay? So please do apply or consider applying. If you don't do it this year and not ready, just stay tuned and plan to apply next year. Okay? So don't see that word competitive and think I'll just not put in the time because you'll likely get the money sometime within the next three years. So I'll repeat the questions. Um, do we have to receive Title I to also get Title IV? No. Um, when we determine all the successful applicants, so our rubric is posted on the website too. So if you want to see how is my application going to be reviewed to determine whether I'm successful or not, know that the rubric that our internal team and external reviewers are going to use is posted there. We do have to um, generate the allocations according to size and poverty. So we can't give a school corporation or a charter school that has 200 kids the same as a school system that is going to have 30,000 kids. We have to equalize it in some way, but no, you'll still be eligible. Okay, so that, and then... $10,000 Yeah. You, uh, 10000 is the minimum that we can allocate, so um, ask for 10000 Okay? That's pretty easy. <laughs> if you think you have fewer needs than that, then join up with another school, um, another charter school, and say collectively our system. Some of uh, the earlier question was, was it one school or the whole system? Yeah. Here, if you, you could apply for one charter school, $10,000 for one school. Or you could say, all of us are going to band together with this same same system, all of us have PBIS needs, and all of us are focusing on this. We want to just join up and do it together. Well, then ask for a number much higher than ten grand because you have many schools working together. That's just for this one, correct? For Title IV alone. Title four. Yes. Then you can come together. Yep. Okay. Now, you can come together for Title III as well, but that's formula, and that's based on the number of EL children you have. Okay. This is going to be based upon how many people apply, how much they ask for, and then we're going to have to make sure it's reasonable in accordance with your population, okay, and your plan. So, but remember that it's a one-year grant. So if you get it this year, you're not going to have it next year. And paying for salaries in a competitive grant is sometimes hard because you're thinking about sustainability. I don't want to hire a counselor to put in all these great supports, and then next year I don't have the money for them. So if you do hire someone, do keep in mind that I know it's short term and I need to improve my system. And then that way that person goes away, my system is still there to support the needs of the students with my existing staff I have right now. Sounds like a, I'm sorry. Yeah. for a stipend what I've already Yeah. Yeah, you might want to contract maybe with an individual mm -hmm. or hire someone knowing that it's not a full-time position, it's a short-term position um, who has expertise. But yeah, you may, if you say we need to greatly improve our discipline practices at our school, we have some disproportionality of how we discipline our kids and our climate of our building is poor. Our student surveys are telling us they don't feel safe. Well, what can we do about it? Please apply for Title IV, use that as your focus, and implement some supports, address it, improve the capacity of your existing teachers, and then that way when the funding goes away, your teachers you have, your principals you have, um, have the capacity to support. Okay. Um, so that one, 21st century, um, both of these areas, coal overseas. Um, so 21st century is our after-school programming, out-of-school time programming. Do any of you receive 21st century? No? Okay. All right, so um, this is a competitive grant as well. Um, in October, we're going to release the request for proposals. So if you said, I really would like some improved after-school programming for my students. They go home to unsafe conditions, not sure where they are, um, or we need improved summer schools. Um, then that's what 21st century can be used for, okay? So pay attention when that RFP comes out. How many of you are signed up for Dr. McCormick's weekly updates that she sends out every Friday? If you're not, go to the department's website and find Dr. McCormick's weekly updates and sign up for that. Any of our, anything that comes out from our agency is going to come out from that. Now it comes out in other avenues too. We know not everyone reads that. <laughs> but it's definitely going to come out in that. Okay, so sign up for that and get these important updates. Are you aware of any charter schools that have received 21st century yeah. grants? Uh -huh. So are there some successful applications online to look at? 
So, okay, so the applications are not posted online, the ones that were successful. Now, you could, you could ask a public agency records request and ask us for them to see, and then we could provide it to you. Um, but are, are the current subgrantees posted on our website? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can go to the website and see who has the grants right now, and then you can talk with those heads of the schools. Um, but yeah, that would be a great, uh, you know, anytime you're applying, Title IV is brand new, so it's hard, to, everyone is doing it for the first time. But 21st century, we have some returning subgrantees that that's a good strategy when you're applying for a competitive grant for the first time to talk to someone else who was successful. She said that those, those, schools, those schools are on the website? Yeah, the, the schools who are current subgrantees um, are, are posted on the website. Okay. You also could do it in partnership with a nonprofit. So if you say, I don't want to do all this work by myself, um, get a nonprofit in your area, Boys and Girls Club, um, community center, some kind of nonprofit that you work closely with, anyways, and apply together. Yeah, all of these grants are at the LEA level, which means in Indiana, school corporation or individual charter. Okay. So, like so all, six all six of your charters could apply individually for any of these things that we're talking about. Okay. All right, so um, new and significantly expanded charters. So within ESSA, it says formula funds that come out to schools there's a specific rule for new and significantly expanded charters that apply to any federal funding, okay? So don't think of just the separate grants. We're now talking about all of them. So if you are a brand new charter, I already told you we have to get those counts from October to generate your allocations. Um, however, let's say that you opened a brand new charter. You're not a first year. You're now a second year, but your enrollment doubled, which is not that uncommon for a charter school. Okay. Know that we now have a process in place to adjust the amount of funding that you have when a scenario such as that happens. Okay. So any of the formula grants, Title I, Title II, Title III, um, and IDEA, which is special ed, those are the four fe uh, formula federal entitlement grants. The other ones we said are competitive. You have to be successful. Those four... Every year, once we get that new count, then we are going to adjust a charter school's allocation positively if you are significantly expanded. Well, what does that mean? Um, we looked at some other state definitions of what significantly <coughs> expanded means. Um, we do have to pay attention or attend to equity here because we have traditional public schools that grow as well. Um, and they don't have any provision at all. Um, they'll just be out of luck. So for charters, we've defined significantly expanded that you added a grade level or that you grew by 50%. Okay? So if one of those two things happen, um, we get your pupil enrollment counts automatically, and then your school corporation amendments, if you added a grade level and went from a K-3 building to a K-4 building, you have to submit a school corporation amendment to our accountability division. We'll take that data and then and then run a higher number for you. But remember those higher numbers are based upon true counts. So Title I is based upon the number of children in poverty out of total. So you may add a grade level, but that may only add your number of children by five. So it may be a very small increase, but it will be true to your number, okay? So that also we're planning to do at least by January 1, but hopefully sooner than that. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so this is a positive that we really haven't done in the past that we're trying to make sure is equitable for our charter schools. Okay, all right. Um, as for ESSA, um, how many of you have read a, the whole 167 pages? Mm -hmm. If you have trouble sleeping tonight, go home and, and pull it up and get that going. But otherwise, um, there are some highlights that we're going to put. We know that you all are busy. It's hard to read that many pages. Once we submit it to the federal government, which is in four days, um, not that we're counting uh, or anything, once we submit it to the federal government, we'll be putting a summary of each section on the website in English and Spanish so you can hand to your teachers, your staff, 
um, parents and so on to know what the six sections say without reading all of it. Um, but it is up on our website um, and it's just slash ESSA. So go to the department's main page and hit slash ESSA. There are six sections um, and each of them are broken up and then you can see the version that was submitted to Governor Holcomb and then we'll put the final version that we submit to the feds up there as well. I want to share some highlights of this to you, um, but just know that these are all tentative. So this is my big disclaimer that um, the feds have not yet approved it. We haven't even submitted it to them yet. Um, but we have been cognizant of what the rules say um, so that hopefully what we're submitting has a great likelihood of being approved. And that way you all know now what hopefully is going to be approved. The federal government has 120 days to review our plan. So we're submitting it in September. So by four months after that, was that October, November, December, January, we as a state will get feedback and then we have three weeks to submit a response. So this has impact on accountability assessments, um, supports for students, teacher effectiveness. So it is important to know what's in there because that will help you just be aware for next year when it is in place, okay? All right, and the reason why we have all of these things is because of our title funding. So um, even though we're not talking about grants anymore, these are requirements or attachments that go with it that we just want to make you aware of. So some highlights um, in size for your subgroups. Um, in order to track a specific subgroup, such as free and reduced, African-American boys, um, English learners, students with disabilities. Our in size is 20, okay? So in order to have that subgroup, you ha would have to have 20 children who fit that category. Now, we still are going to report out on DOE Compass if you have an in size of 10, but you won't be held accountable until the number gets to 20, okay? So that's in size info that's in the plan. Now accountability is one of the biggest pieces of the plan itself. Um, and so um, if you have 20 children who fit the categories that I'll share here, then this is what the accountability system would look like and how the weights are distributed. So if you have 20 children who um, took I-STEP and have the ability to show achievement, did they pass or not? then 42.5% of the total performance would be based upon that. If you have 20 children who took the test to have the ability to show growth, and remember growth is fourth grade and up because we need two years of data. So if you have 20 children who fit that category, then you would be able to show growth and 42.5% would be focused on growth, okay? 10% um, is a new Indicator under ESSA, ESSA requires us to have an academic indicator tied to English language proficiency. So this is going to be if you have 20 English learners and all of them have to take access, which is our state assessment. And so it's going to check, did those English learners meet their growth targets on access? So if let's, for example, if you have a third grade English learner who is 10, and was a 1.5 to start with, then we're going to use that data to say where should that child, based upon those three criteria, should be next year when they're in fourth grade. Did they hit the target that they should have gotten? Okay. So um, if you have 20 children who are English learners, then you would have an accountability indicator of 10% and that would contribute to your overall um, accountability designation. The last one, 5%, is um, our um, student success indicator. As a state, we had to select something that was other than test scores. And so for now, we have, uh, have chosen to address chronic absenteeism. The ESSA plan does state that we want to focus in the future on climate and culture of buildings. So things like it could be something like a student survey. Okay, but that's not yet to be determined. What do we have the capacity to do now? and that is chronic absenteeism. So the plan has further info, but it's looking at how many children attended at a high rate or improved their rate of attendance. And those two things would contribute to positively addressing your score for that 5%.
Yeah, so this English learners are 10, so if you don't have 20, then half of that is going to go to growth, half will go to achievement. So these two numbers will change by 5% each. That, as long as you have 20 kids in your school, then you'll have 20 kids. That should always stay, yes. Um, so you would only, yeah, so that won't ever be distributed unless you don't have 20 children. If you don't have 20 children, you won't have a grade anyways. Yes. Okay. So yeah, the likelihood is that you'll have either this chart or one that says 47 and a half, 47 and a half, and five. Okay. So this is for elementary. High school is a little different because we have additional indicators of graduation rate and college and career readiness. Okay. Now, Dr. McCormick is doing some regular um, list or community meetings where she's been talking about this in detail. And we know that there um, are considerations here with how well our children are performing at the high school level on their GQEs and also how many teachers we have that are certified to teach dual credit. Um, and so those things are definitely on our radar of things that we have to focus on as a state. Um, but currently it would be 30 and 30 for grad rates and college and career readiness. College and career readiness are the number of children who are participating and successful in AP, dual credit classes, IB, or technical and career um, licenses. So 30 and 30 for those, 15 and 15 for achievement and growth, and then you have the same 10% for English language proficiency. So your same question earlier, this would be distributed to growth and achievement. For English learners, um, we have a, an accountability flexibility if they are brand new to the country. Um, we have some flexibility. Um, I don't know about you, but if I move to another country, I hope that they wouldn't ask me to pass the graduation qualifying exam the first day I got there in a language I had never seen. Um, and so we as a state are allowed some flexibility for children who are recently enrolled immigrants who are English learners. Okay, so in the past we had some flexibility, it now has changed that I hopefully you'll find that is greater flexibility for the student and the school now. So we've selected the second of the two options, which means that first year, instead of excluding the child from taking a test, you would have all of your children take the test, but it really is not going to count for anything for the student or the school except positively adding to your participation rate. Okay, so you'll count that child as one of your 95% that need to take it. Um, then that recently arrived English learner, second year, um, you're going to count participation again, but this time you'll have two years worth of data, so you'll be able to calculate growth for that child for English language arts, and that's the subject we're talking about here. Math, science, social studies applies like any other child. But for ELA, we're going to look at their growth from this year to last year, and that will count positively um, towards your school's growth rating. We ran the data for your English learners, and typically a year one English learner compared to a year two English learner, their growth rate is tremendous compared to other children because they're learning the language and they'll do much, much better. So across the board, it's added positively to our schools. Um, and then year three, they're treated like any other child with growth and achievement, okay? So this is different. Currently we say, just don't take the test year one, year two, you're counted like any other child. Now under ESSA, you're going to take the test and attempt it to get some data, but it doesn't really count for anything other than participation, and then we'll count your growth, and then year three is now when you would be treated like any other child, okay? All right, so these are some of the indicators that we've shared already, um, but we're looking at growth towards proficiency. Um, because in that EL indicator, we're looking at children who show growth, they'll need two years of data. So it will be first graders on up, okay? Um, chronic absenteeism, here's some info for this. Someone who attends at a high rate, so 96% of the time or someone who improves their attendance from last year by 3%. Okay, either one of those would count positively towards that 5% chronic absenteeism. Okay, 
Um, and then how are schools held accountable? So if their focus or priority now, we have new terms under ESSA called comprehensive and targeted. Comprehensive, there's a definition of that in our ESSA plan, but that means the lowest 5% of our Title I schools, which by data would mean about 88 schools. So 88 out of 2,000 schools would hit that bottom 5%, okay? If you're a public high school who graduates less than 67% of your students, or if you have a chronically low performing subgroup um, in your Title I building as well. So chronically low performing would mean that if I looked at just your English learners or just your free and reduced, do they perform as poorly as that bottom 5%? So if they were a school all unto themselves, if you had 50 English learners and they do as poorly as one of those 88 schools did as a whole, um, then that would be considered a chronically underperforming subgroup. Okay? All right. Um, and targeted would be consistently underperforming. So um, it is performing as poorly, but um, it takes you are allowed five years of improvement to try and get that subgroup to improve, and if it doesn't, then it would slide to a comprehensive status. Um, so one of the things right now that I would pay attention to are the opportunities to provide input and feedback to our state board. This is something I'm repeating from Dr. McCormick. She's been saying this a lot, to get out, get your voice out. Right now, the state board is conducting a graduation pathways group to make sure to try and address. A lot of states have one diploma but then they honor it or address it in multiple ways. Indiana historically have had multiple diplomas and the feds are saying you can only count this one and up. So how can we address that positively without negatively um, impacting our schools just because of the nature of the way we do things here? Um, so we're trying to make sure that that issue is addressed. But if it's not addressed, We'll have a lot of schools that have less than 67% of their students getting a core 40 and up, which is what the feds are telling us now, that you can't count your general diploma and your grad rate. You can give a diploma, you just can't count it. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of weird. You're going to fall under the conference support. Yeah. Quick. So we, we want to make sure that we're addressing that. So that there is work going on right now. So this, these are slides from our director of assessment. Um, if you, um, you know, there's info about this on our, on our website. The state is shifting from I-STEP to I-LEARN. That's going to begin in 1819. Currently, there's an RFP right out um, for vendor submission. Um, those proposals were due in August. So right now, they're working on making sure that, the, that those are reviewed and we'll have a contract executed in October. Okay, so those are some clear deadlines that are coming up. Um, what are some of the changes? You're pretty familiar with what ISTEP does now. We're not changing standards. We're still using the same standards, same content areas, same accountability, utilizes technology. What will be different with iLearn? iLearn is going to use computer adaptive technology. So if a child is taking a third grade test, likely that teacher knows day one who is going to pass and who isn't in the spring. Um, so with iLearn, we're trying to get better data about how much did they grow beyond third grade or if they're well below, how far below are they to help the teachers have data to catch them up. Um, we are assessing those grades um, with the standards um, uh, that are adopted. One window instead of two, okay? Um, additional accommodations and student supports, one of the things we're asking for are things like bilingual dictionaries that are built into the assessment instead of you having to use a paper copy and look it up outside of the assessment. So that's an example. Um, scores due by July 1, because it's a new assessment, new features, we'll have to address the cut scores. Um, and working right now with a team of educators to develop the blueprints for those assessments. All right, um, so um, the department is recruiting um, educators to support us for creating those blueprints, looking at item specs, auditing those items, so the specific questions, reviewing those items and setting standards, okay? 
So right now we're working on that. Now hopefully you don't have any min many in detail assessment questions because I'll pass those on. Um, anything that you have from what we shared? Okay. So know that we do answer emails and pick up our phone or we'll call you back, okay? So if you have any questions about what we shared, specifically the grants, um, let us know and we'll support you in that because we want them to be used to support your students. So thanks for uh, coming and we'll, we'll hopefully talk soon, okay?